Okay, let's jump into this. <coughs> Excuse me. So I've called this altitude training. You can consider it, <coughs> excuse me, pulmonary edema. You can consider it hypoxic training, um, low O2 training, altitude training. They kind of mean the same thing. It's taking the stress of altitude and using that to leverage improvements in performance at sea level. So what we're going to look at is a, really a brief recap of what adaptations would affect performance. And a lot of the uh, adaptations we talked about in the last section are the candidates here for performance improvements. We're going to look at um, if this response is universal and agreed upon. So do individuals generally all adapt the same way, or are there other methods of adaptation wherein altitude might confer performance benefits. And that leads to the idea of models of hypoxic exposure. So there's two major models or two major mechanisms of how time spent at altitude and adaptations to that time can influence performance. And it may be that some individuals respond to one and some the other. And there might be some crossover, but we're not exactly sure. And lastly, I'll try to summarize everything that we know into one optimal prescription. So like you have directives for after going to the gym, 20 grams of whey protein right away and then every two hours afterwards to maintain protein synthesis. What can we do with altitude exposure to maximize the adaptation? Is it live high, train low? What kind of altitude do we need? How long do you have to spend at altitude? There, we're pretty close to finding one ideal prescription to maximize the benefits for the majority of the population. So let's talk about the background. Just like in the last section with high altitude physiology, here, we're not dealing with high altitude, but the fact that when you move to altitude and oxygen saturation is compromised limits endurance performance, limits aerobic performance. And this whole area was largely uh, brought into being and kicked into high gear by the Olympics in Mexico City where at 2200 meters, which is high by terrestrial standards, not high altitude standards, more of a moderate altitude, high performance athletes at this altitude needed a mechanism to be able to deal with this stress. And um, riding on the coattails of his success with the Everest expeditions, Griffith Pugh was contracted by um, many sports agencies to consult on how to best prepare athletes for this specific stress. And the theory goes Actually, the theory for one of the major models goes as follows. So the stress is lower saturation. Blood PO2 drops, and then some things happen. Maybe HIF one's involved, but whatever the mechanisms, saturation is compromised, with, which limits carrying capacity. So we've already observed in climbers, carrying capacity adapts. Carrying capacity increases, hemoglobin goes up, red cell volume goes up um, in a manner that's proportional to your time spent under that stress. Now this response is meant in its purest sense to allow the body to succeed in those conditions. You're at altitude, PO2 is lower, saturation is lower, your body is adapting because it's stressed and it wants your time spent in that new environment to be managed better or handled more easily. That's what the body is thinking. It's responding to allow normal function in this new environment. But you can change the environment after reaping the benefits of that adaptation. And in theory, higher O2 carrying capacity should not only allow you to succeed at that altitude, but should confer added benefits to performance at lower altitudes as well. At sea level, low altitude, moderate altitude. So higher carrying capacity 
is thought to be one of the, the bottlenecks or the limits to VO2 max. Why there is a max. Carrying capacity is thought to be one of the reasons of why there is a max. So therefore, if we can enhance carrying capacity, we can increase that max, give more potential to perform, and therefore improve performance. There is a trade-off, and in theorizing about this, um, this set of adaptations and, and how to best improve performance or what is optimal for performance, you could consider the fact that here at sea level, air pressure is the highest it will ever be. At altitude, pressure is lower. And we know that because it compromises PO2 and results in all of those um, the effects that we studied in the last section. But with a lower pressure, there's fewer molecules around, fewer molecules to run into, and air resistance is lower. So in theory, there's even a benefit to exercising at altitude. And could there be some ideal crossover point where air resistance is low, but it's not low enough to compromise PO2, and so some low to moderate altitude allows for the fastest performance, more than the uh, adaptive side and, and, and more than just the, uh, the low, low altitude sea level exposure itself. There have been a little bit, uh, a few research studies exploring this idea, and we can kind of strike it. There's few situations where aerodynamics outweigh the need for oxygen, especially when you consider the person performing as an individual uh, requiring a constant um, rate of energy expenditure. The need for oxygen outweighs any potential aerodynamic benefits of moving to altitude and performing or competing in an area of lower air resistance. It's an interesting little twist, even though um, until recently, the one hour cycling time trial was set at 2,000 meters, which is the idea that kind of spurred this trade-off notion. Um, the most recent world record two years ago was set at 200 meters of altitude. So completely throwing that idea out the window that cycling fast and reaping the benefits of a lower air pressure would, uh, would mean that there's some ideal trade-off where at altitude you could perform somewhat better. It seems also that in, in uh, assessments of running, the threshold is around four to 800 meters. Um, at those distances, there's no time for aerodynamics to really come into play. And it's all energetics the more that you can load the body with oxygen and use that oxygen for energy, the better your performance will be. So an interesting thought experiment, but we'll get that out of the way as we start. It's really about O2 carrying, O2 delivery to the muscles. And so in the context of performing at altitude or using altitude to perform better at sea level, it's much different than the last section that we had just explored. Sea level, of course, is the same, zero meters. Here, for our purposes, we're defining low altitude as up to 500 meters. So from sea level to about 500 meters is what we'll call low. No, 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 sorry, sorry. I'm reading this wrong. Anything below 500 meters is sea level. 500 to 1,000 is low. 2,000 to 3,000, moderate. And these are usually the altitudes on the table. Mexico City, 2,200 meters. It's not often that high-performance sport occurs in situations higher than that. So when considering using the adaptations of altitude to enhance performance, we're looking to sea level, low, or moderate altitude. We're not looking to high altitudes like we, we were in the last section. So that's how we define these limits moving forward. Zero to 500 for sea level, 500 to 2,000 for low, 2,000 to 3,000 for moderate. 
So let's talk about the two physiological models in which the body responds to hypoxia. I'll present the first one today and then we'll get into the second one in class on Thursday. The first one is the classical approach of the body responding to hypoxia. And we call it the uh, hematological model, the blood-related model. The idea that if PO2 in the body is low, that low PO2 stimulates the adaptation in and of itself. Low saturation of oxygen stimulates HIF-1 and or other enzymes. A signaling cascade uh, carries through to produce EPO in the kidneys. And EPO is erythropoietin. You've probably heard about this anecdotally. It's a, it's a, a hormone that could be synthesized um, in the laboratory, a synthetic hormone. It's also produced endogenously in the body, and its job is to activate red blood cell production in uh, the marrow of long bones. So the hematological model says when you move to altitude and that low PO2 exists, it triggers the activation of EPO. EPO in turn produces more red blood cells. When we increase red cell content, we have a parallel increase in hematocrit or uh, increase in hemoglobin. Therefore, carrying capacity goes up. A pretty nice linear sequence of events. EPO stimulates red cell production. Red cells contain hemoglobin. Hemoglobin binds oxygen. Oxygen carrying capacity increases. The hematological model. And this is what I imagine you are thinking of when we talk about models of adaptation. This is what we proposed in the last series of slides. Um, chronic uh, time spent at high altitudes means hematocrit goes up, carrying capacity goes up. This is the first model through which we can increase sea level or lower level exercise performance. And you have a schematic like this in the slides online that just shows you, uh, it's just a stylized cartoon really. It shows you EPO here, which is circulating in the blood. It's produced by the kidneys. And when it's in high enough quantities, it binds to receptors in long bone. This is within the bone itself. And the marrow initiates the um, specialization of stem cells to form red blood cells. This is what we want, a higher rate of red cell production that increases carrying capacity. So, to test this model, we want to see if the artificial increase in red cell volume confers a benefit on carrying capacity, uh, functional ability, so VO2 max, and performance, running a race or a time trial. We want to evaluate this model to see if it works. We want to look in those areas. And uh, a, a pretty nice classic study out of the 80s, I think this is early 80s, early mid 80s, the effect of induced erythrocythemia on aerobic work capacity is if we artificially elevate red cell content, what does the increased red cell content do as far as performance and exercise are concerned? Um, I put this up because this, uh, this fellow here is my old PhD advisor, actually. Lawrence Spree. And this is work that he did at York through um, Hospital for Sick Kids in uh, conjunction with Toronto. This is some of his PhD work. So induced erythrocythemia. If altitude confers benefits by promoting red cell formation, artificially increasing red cell volume should do the same. So this is a study of blood doping, essentially. This is a study where individuals are uh, contracted, they join the study, they donate uh, a sample of blood, that blood is stored in the time between that donation and the analysis, their body is um, returning red cell and plasma volume to normal, they're expanding blood volume back to normal, and then upon readministration of that collected sample, They've expanded red cell volume, they've expanded plasma volume, they have what's called induced erythrocythemia. 
That is, we've artificially increased the number of red cells and the amount of hemoglobin. Therefore, we've artificially increased carrying capacity. And what effect does that have on functional ability at sea level? So this is meant to test the hematological model, which suggests that blood specifically is at the center of these adaptations. This was uh, Spreet's early work, and he's not the major author on the paper, so it's not set up in an easy-to-understand way. We have two groups, group A and group B. Both groups get reinfused blood or a sham infusion, which is essentially saline. They don't know which is which. One of them is red cells. One of them is nothing. And so they're blinded. It's controlled. There's a control group, which is the saline infusion. Group A gets the saline first, group B gets the infusion first. And the time points, the injections, were all done at the same time point, and I'll lead you through those as we go through. But I've highlighted here for you the, the overlapping sections. These are the values that we want to compare. There are, these are the, uh, the reinfusion of red cells, um, this light blue area, and the sham infusions are these dark blue bars, or darker blue bars. So group A gets the sham infusion first, followed by their own blood. Group B gets their blood first, followed by the saline infusion. It should be noted this is um, started. It's uh, seven weeks post-collection. So the initial measurements are a long time after the initial samples are collected, which allows red cell volume to return to normal, blood volume to return to normal, and control is the normal situation. So there's no effect of collecting the sample in these control values for group A and group B. And like I mentioned, group A is sham first, which is saline infusion, and the effects of that saline infusion, followed by reinfusion of their own blood. Group B is the opposite, blood first, and then the sham infusion. So I think it's easier to, um, to understand this layout if we consider the injections. When is the sham uh, administered? When is the blood administered? And in group A, saline is infused at this point here, which makes sense, right before the sham measurement of VO2 max. And this entire process takes one week. So infusion of the saline happens on day zero. Seven days later, this measurement is made, VO2 max is assessed, and then injection number two occurs where the blood is readministered or the blood is reinfused. So this sham bar takes one week time. And that matches the layout in group B where instead of getting the sham first, they get the reinfusion of their own blood at time point zero. And then seven days later, just like group A, they get a second infusion. So even though these aren't linearly lined up on the slide, these time points coincide. Seven days after the infusion of their blood, a second infusion occurs. This is where they get the sham treatment and then the measurements continue on afterwards. So the two sets of arrows are temporally aligned, even though they're not aligned on the graph. Does that make sense? OK, good. So what do we see in this graph? What do we see in this graph? We don't see the, uh, the changes in carrying capacity. We just see the, the total uh, assessment of VO2 max. But there's about a 6 or 7% increase in carrying capacity with each of the blood reinfusions. But most importantly, 5 or 6% increase in VO2 max when blood is reinfused, independent of the sham control. So sham infusion does nothing. Blood infusion increases VO2 max. There's no ordered effect. There's no effect of injecting the sham treatment later. VO2 max is unchanged when the saline solution is infused. It's only increased with the uh, reinfusion of their own blood. So induced erythrocythemia, 
increases VO2 max by about 5%. Induced erythrocythemia increases VO2 max by about 5%. Not only that, but the increase in VO2 max lasts 16 weeks. 17 weeks if you consider this extra week tacked on to group B. Induced erythrocythemia increases VO2 max acutely and it persists for at least 16 weeks. That is a pretty uh, long-lived improvement in functional capacity. And VO2 max is what we'll call a measure of functional capacity. I didn't touch on this yet, did I? No. So uh, normal volemic erythrocythemia is a a confirmation, a measure made at one day post-infusion to make sure that when you're reinfusing, uh, reinfusing, when you reinfuse blood, you're delivering red cells and delivering plasma. And so blood volume goes up a lot. When blood volume goes up a lot, that sends signals to the kidneys to filter out that excess fluid. You don't want that large volume of blood. And within 24 hours, the kidneys do their job of excreting the extra fluid. The cells stay, fluid is filtered out. So this is a confirmation, 24 hours post-infusion, which is why we have this 24-hour bar. Um, volume is normal, red cells are high. Normal volemic erythrocythemia at 24 hours. Blood volume is back down to normal after this uh, large infusion, but the red cell content is, uh, is higher, is proliferated like was intended. So the effects that we're observing are due to having more red blood cells, not having more red blood cells in plasma. Measuring VO2 max is one thing, and this is an impressive finding. That there's a 5% increase in VO2 max just by injecting, or, or infusing rather, blood over uh, a small window, over 24 hours. This persists for 16 weeks, but the, the performance, the applied result, the applied benefit of this increase in VO2 max doesn't necessarily follow suit. So despite having increased aerobic capacity, right away and for 16 weeks after infusion, performance goes up, but tends to normalize. It returns back to normal over the course of those 16 weeks. So for some reason, the increase in VO2 max translates to a performance benefit right away, but we lose that performance be uh, benefit gradually. The performance benefit returns to normal even though VO2 max has been elevated and stays elevated over those 16 weeks. We're not sure why. It could be that over the course of the, like this is four months. It could be over the course of four months with a higher VO2 max that their training has naturally picked up. Maybe um, there's some central cardiac output adaptations that uh, facilitate VO2 max but that don't result in an increase or a, a higher performance over time. It could be that this study was 22 weeks long. 22 weeks long. Almost, well, what's, what's half a year? 26 weeks is half a year. This is almost six months. It could just be that when they're, when they're coming into the laboratory on, on month four, they're exhausted and they're not wanting to perform as well. This is a time to exhaustion measure, and so being exhausted is the criteria for ending the test. If you're fatigued mentally and possibly physically, you're more likely to exhaust early on. So it's, it's hard to say why the performance goes down 
when the aerobic capacity measurements stay high over those 16 weeks. But importantly, they go up. They go up acutely, and it's due to the expansion of red cell volume. This is um, the classic method of blood doping, taking out your own blood sample, storing it in a fridge, reinfusing it later. What if you don't have that lead time? What if you don't have the ability to extract your own blood sample and store it and then reinfuse it? This is what's um, gained popularity recently, popularity in the, the dark circles of sport, I suppose the use of recombinant or synthetic human erythropoietin to artificially induce that enzyme, which increases um, red cell volume and carrying capacity um, uh, as a result. So <laughs> I, I really like this slide because it's, I like the name of the, uh, the EPO which is, uh, it's, it's meant for racehorses, but blood, blood building explosion injection sounds a little bit fun. So is it possible that we can see the same benefits without having the arduous process of extracting blood seven weeks before we compete and then reinfusing it at the event? Is it possible to induce this erythrocythemia just with injections of the hormone erythropoietin. We can synthesize this easily in a lab. We know that it activates red blood cell synthesis. And before this study, which is fairly new, this was, I don't have a date on it, I think it's about 2012. This one's fairly new. Before this, the injections required uh, six by three times per week injections. So six weeks, three days per week injections. And we see nice, robust improvements in VO2 max, similar to what we saw with the blood infusion, and a similar improvement in time to exhaustion, but we don't have a time course of information here. Six weeks is still a lot of time. So this study set out to see, is it possible that we don't need six weeks of injecting uh, EPO to observe improvements in red cell content? And the time course is every week, an assessment of these uh, blood values. The hemoglobin group, or sorry, the, uh, the EPO group in the uh, four rows at the bottom. This is three weeks of daily injections only that causes an improvement in hemoglobin concentration. So after only three weeks, mind you these are daily injections, we observe a 7% increase in uh, hemoglobin concentration in the EPO group. Compare that to the control group, that stays pretty much level. There's no change, and if there is a change, it's a slight decrease over the course of uh, this five-week trial. Three weeks is required with recombinant EPO to be able to observe a meaningful increase in hemoglobin. What benefits does this confer? VO2 max should go up, performance should go up. We see here um, representative traces of a VO2 max test. So these are average VO2 max test values. Each of these circles is a measurement of VO2 at a given point in time. So a lot of data here. Rather than averaging everything over one minute intervals, these are raw data for an individual showing in uh, the control trial versus the EPO. Oh, wait. Sorry, not control versus EPO, pre versus post. Pre is in dark, post are the open circles. The EPO group saw an improvement in VO2 max. Improvement of about 10% for this individual. 500 mils out of 3,500 uh, is actually over 10%. What is that? 14, 13, 14%? Yeah, about that. So from pre to post, recombinant EPO shows a nice upward shift of this graph where the control group before and the control group after are essentially um, riding the same trend up. 
they essentially overlap and there's no functional difference in the terminal VO2 during this VO2 max test. You know, what I'm going to do, um, the next slide is a little bit complicated. So rather than try to cram it into the last two minutes of class, we'll, uh, we'll come back, pick this up on Thursday, and summarize the hematological model before getting into the non-hematological model and then um, diving in a bit further. So let's leave it here for now, understanding the idea that um, however we increase red cell volume and or hemoglobin content, there's a pretty robust, consistent improvement in VO2 max. We haven't seen performance changes yet for this study, but we know that at least the induced erythrocythemia increases performance, so this should also increase performance. We'll talk about that on Thursday, and uh, let's call it there for today.